All right, what's up everyone? Dr. Stallstrom here with my buddy, my mentor, and fitness expert, Michael Sartain. Um, I've stayed with him at his house. Uh, I've done workouts with him, and I'm very happy to have him here because he's gonna tell us how his busy lifestyle in Las Vegas, the busiest city in the world, and the craziest, most chaotic city, how he stays up late, and is able to be healthy, and he's able to take care of his sleep, and he has so much energy to talk to so many girls, and is motivated, and he can fuck these girls as much as he wants, as long as he wants. How does he do all that? We're gonna get all the secrets in this mastermind. So, let's get started. I'm already tired from that introduction. I need some coffee, man. <laughs> I didn't know I was doing all that. That's crazy. Oh, man. He's gonna do that and what? So, uh, Let's get started with a little bit of, just describe your lifestyle. I talked a little bit about it, but just how crazy things are in Vegas for you and how long it's been since you've been doing this. So there's a, there's a way, uh, I'm gonna describe the philosophy and my lifestyle at the same time. There is a way to delineate different parts of your life so that you can take the chaos in your life and make it, turn it into order, okay? So for me, it's like you would say, you would look on my social media and be like, oh man, it looks like you go out every night. I don't go out every night. I might post a picture every night, but I don't go out every night. Or somebody else tags me in a picture. So like, we might go, I might go out one night in a week, and I might have uh, or my photographer take 100 pictures that night, and then me or somebody, someone else in my company might post a picture. So it looks like, because, because I do uh, nightclub promotions, it looks like I'm out every night, and that's sort of the purpose for that. But in reality, I go to bed at four every night, four o'clock in the morning. I wake up at 11.30 every morning and I, uh, I trade stock options from, for about the last 90 minutes of the trading day, which is 11.30 to 1, a, 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, and I do that every day. I go to the gym, I take my pre-workout every day at 4.35 p.m. I'm in the gym every day at 5 p.m. I stay from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, uh, Monday through Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, Saturday, I'm in the gym from 11.30 to uh, 12.30 a.m. Uh, every night. Uh, so so hmm. everything is scheduled, so it looks like just random gym time, random club thing. It's right. all, for me, it may look random, all of it is planned out ahead of time. And one of the things that I found, especially if you go out a lot, is that um, if, when you're beginning, I like, like Luke, uh, my best friend Luke, who will take out and do his boot camps or whatever, when he does his boot camps, they need to be there at 10.30. A lot of times it's because they need to warm up to do approaches, a lot of times it's because that's the only time they can get in the club, especially in a city like LA where you have to be there earlier. Uh, I would recommend that if you have that part, that if you're not a newbie, don't stay there from 10.30 to two, because for me, I'm usually in the club no, more, no longer than 40 minutes, uh, usually around 20 and then I'll leave. And I, and I treat it like I'm the mayor coming to make an appearance. Because again, like my, my whole persona when I go out is I wanna be connecting people to each other. The cold approach just happens when you do that. You don't have to like think about cold approach or what am I gonna say to this girl. I'm constantly connecting people. So if I spend 20 minutes in three different clubs at night and I shake some hands and I introduce this person to this person, because I know in my mind, this guy is a photographer who worked for Maximum Playboy and this girl is a model who is like just, she's so fine and doesn't even know that she's fine because she's been in a shitty relationship for seven years and just figured out that she's a 10. I need to introduce them. You understand what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. so, I, mm -hmm. but how long does that take? That doesn't take hours, that takes a few minutes. And so that's kind of the, 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 the first key. Uh, the other thing I would tell you is stop listening to music. Me and Ty are 100% in agreement on this. I don't listen to music anymore. 100% um, audiobooks, a podcast that are, that are intelligent podcasts that help you. Right. And third, uh, uh, classes online. So I've taken, uh, Intro to astronomy. I took a, a finance course from Yale, uh, uh, entrepreneurship course from Stanford. They're all free on iTunes. You you can take Coursera, but you got to pay for it. Right. And also the Khan Academy, if you have like short questions about certain things. Um, every moment of your day that you're not speaking to someone else, you should have earphones in your in your ears, and you should be listening to something that is getting you closer to what you want to do. If you can do those things and then plan the plan the chaos, if you will, right. then you can, like me, there's no like such thing as a day off. I, I mean, I, I plan to go to the gym seven days a week. Do we go to the gym seven days a week? Of course not. 
Of course, I, can, I don't get to the gym seven days a week, right? I may have busy, I may have meetings that whole day, but if I plan to go seven days a week, then I end up going five, and then then I'm good. You understand what I'm saying? So for me, there, you just have to make, you have to habitually plan around the chaos, and then everything sort of works out. You, we talked about this before. Like, well, did I just come from Chipotle? I eat at the same two places every day, and it take. I know exactly how much time it's going to take. And people are like, "Don't you get tired of eating the same thing?" I'm like. It doesn't taste like it. Skinny tastes better than being fat. You know what I'm saying? So that for me, it's like I like eating the same thing. I don't really agree with a lot of what Tim Ferriss says, but he was right on that one thing. Find a couple meals and just eat those same meals over and over again. That part he was completely co completely correct about. So that, in a short answer, is like the way that I'm able to do so many things. Uh, and then fit it into my day. Because I do get that question a lot. I, I trade stock options and then I host parties. Uh, I work for Karma and Maxim and do stuff. Yeah, how do you have time to do all that? It's because everything is planned out habitually. That's, a, that's the, sorry, long answer there. No, no, it's great. So, because a, a big part of Pumped is having routines, right? right? So, when I give the menu to them, I also tell them what times they should be eating. Yes. So, you know, if they want to do intermittent fasting or they want to follow certain macros, they should be eating at certain times and working out at certain times yes. and then eating different meals after working out, uh -huh. right? So for example, having carbs after working out. You now you mentioned Chipotle. I mean, we've gone to Chipotle many times and you know, Michael is one of the reasons that, you know, I had that aha moment in my pickup career where I said, why is it that Michael can go out all this, you know, going out, doing stock options, as well as having the cognitive ability to merge sets, introduce people to each other, having that multitasking ability that I don't have. So what is that X factor? And slowly I realized that one of the main things is your health. The fact that you are working out, the fact that you are sleeping well and having this routine. So is there any part of the routine at night or in the morning that you follow? I mean, are you doing something every day that you're like training your brain to be ready to go out? Um, so, uh, it depends because I work out uh, like Monday through Thursday. I work out around five to six, and then on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I work out from like like I said, sometimes midnight to one a.m. and then I'll go cool. out because it's remember, understand it's Vegas. It's different in every city, yeah. but for me, I like to show up at the club around one thirty because all the industry tables leave at two a.m. and so I like to be right there, just stay for thirty minutes, shake everybody's hand. They're all j joyful and happy. I don't like the walk-ins. I don't like to set sit there for two and a half hours because I don't drink alcohol. So. Um, for me, there's one of the things that I started doing was I would go to the gym at 11. I would plan this whole thing out where I take my pre-workout. Like I, by the way, I, I don't try to use a lot of caffeine, right. but when I do, I try to time my caffeine or whatever stimulant I'm gonna take, I time it. So I know that if I just had a cup of coffee and I'm not feeling it, it's not time to have another cup of coffee. It's time to like, like wait you know, for it to take effect and mm -hmm. then and then maybe four or five hours. I also know that I need to not drink a cup of coffee when I know I'm gonna take my pre-workout 45 minutes later. I know that it's gonna lose some of the effect. My body can only metabolize so much caffeine, mm -hmm. right? So for, in my, my, stand, my standpoint, uh, let's just say I'm gonna go, I'm gonna meet some friends. Uh, let's say uh, all the DJs in Las Vegas go on at 1 a.m. at the clubs. So let's say I wanna walk in about 1.15 to 1.30. Uh, let's say Calvin Harris is playing at Hakkasan. So I'm going to go, I'm going to take my pre-work at 11.45, walk into the gym at midnight. I'm going to work out from midnight to one, okay? So cardio in the beginning for a few minutes, and then I'm going to do whatever weight routine I have. I'm going to probably try to finish uh, just a little bit before one. Then I'm going to go take a shower, and I'm still in that mode of like throwing up that heavy weight when I get out of the shower, put my clothes on, and then go, go to the club. And I'm walking... I just noticed that I'm walking to the venue with a different, like a different, um, like I don't know what the word I'm looking for, a different energy. Wow. And and then there's like, I, I, you, if you've ever been to the gym, like, and you've re, you really put up a lot of weight and you've done something really impressive, that's like, and you're looking in the mirror, that a lot of times that's your most confident self. Maybe not for everybody, hmm. but for a lot of people that is, especially when you start to see those gains. And I think you should take that mentality and take it straight into a nightclub or whatever social venue you're going to. Take that best self in there, that, that energy, that high self-esteem right in there with you. And I notice a lot more 
uh, positive interactions and just a lot more fun of a night. I also found that like if you find a lot of anxiety from having to do a bunch of approaches, um, there, there's two different ways to get over that. One is to do a lot of approaches. The other way to do it is to go into them with a different mindset, which is for me, I want to connect people to other people. So I'm always looking mm -hmm. for like, I, I, for me, there's this like web of, you ever see like a police cl a crime drama? Yeah. They got the one guy at the top and then they got the lines to all the lieutenants and everything. My mind is always working like that. Like this guy works here and he, this is his best friend mm -hmm. and they need this and how can I connect them with this? I used this example before, I had a friend of mine, she's a playmate and I had another uh, buddy of mine, well he's not a buddy of mine, I barely know him. He was uh, one of the directors from one of the large nightlife, group, nightlife groups in Las Vegas and I was walking out of the club with her and I turned to him and I said, hey, uh, hey Alex, this is my friend, Kaya, and I introduced him, knowing she wants a job at a nightclub, knowing he needs beautiful women to work at his nightclubs, and the both of them being up, up status right here, you know, Euclid's equation, if A equals B and A equals C, then B equals C. If, I, if he sees that I'm introducing her, if he sees I'm introducing him to somebody important, she sees that I'm introducing her to somebody important, then they both think I'm important. Does that make sense? And I don't really have to do anything other than that to make that happen. Just be the connector. If you go out with that attitude where I am just constantly trying to be the connector, you'll find that like things just happen. It's so funny because I get the question all the time, like how do you go from this social situation where you're at a table with 25 girls, how do you pull? And I'm like, I've never thought of that because I've never had that problem. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like it, those things just handle themselves. You j I got a lot of flack for this. You just get chose. I said that in one of uh, yeah. Luke's videos and I got so much flack for that because I said, you just get chose? That's so beta. Like, yeah, bro, it's beta. I go to a club and girls want to ask me for my phone number and girls pull me to the side. I remember the first time girls started pulling me to the side to take pictures with me to post on their social media. Like, that's not beta. Like, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But, and, I, and I'm not saying it to brag, I'm saying it because there was a time when I wasn't doing that. And I remember what that felt like and then what this feels like now. And honestly, it's one of the reasons I stopped teaching pickup because I felt like my experience was so outside the realm mm. of what I could teach mm. that I just decided, let me just go full into this other thing that I'm doing. Mm. And then if somebody wants me to speak at pickup conferences, I'll come back and do it. But, right. but a lot of times, like even Owen will tell me, Tyler, oh, uh, Tyler Durden, he'll even tell me like a lot of the times, one of the things that I say, because this is the reality of the situation is when you connect people like this yeah. and you make a huge social circle like this, um, you, your life almost becomes unidentifiable to other people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I took mystery and matador to Dan Bilzerian's house. Like th I just think about that for a second, right? Yeah. Like I, I was the one doing that. Like I'm not like, the, I'm not as popular as any of those guys, but I was the one who made that connection. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it, it, like, it's always things like that. Like uh, Luke works for Owen. I introduced Luke to Owen. Um, I introduced like, there are three, uh, maybe four instructors in RSD right now, I introduced them to one of their girlfriends, maybe not their current girlfriend, but a girlfriend that they've had, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm always trying to be the connector, because I can see the good match. You right. understand what I'm saying? Right. So I, I use this example all the time. You have a drunk buddy who always gets drunk, and you have the, your buddy who's a DUI lawyer. Right? <laughs> like it doesn't have to be the playmate and the and the nightclub exec. It could be, right, it could be the roofer and the guy with the fucked up roof. Yeah. If you keep doing that, then you're offering value and it costs you nothing and you get invited to everything. Right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. You uh, and then and then the other thing that I that I understood is that like women don't need you to get into a nightclub, obviously, but they want to be led. They want to feel a little bit of protection. Because I didn't understand like uh, not that I've ever walked in heels, but from what I've seen, like you're in a really pretty expensive dress with really expensive heels on and you go into a club full of big sweaty dudes, creepy dudes who are trying to touch you and knock you over. You want a man there to help you get to the table. And girls go to those tables not because they're snobs, but because they want to get away from the dudes who are going to fuck up this look that they spent four hours preparing. Um, so that, that's the reason why that is. And if you understand that, they, they just need someone to help. They need, they don't need. They want someone to help lead them through this whole big chaotic nightclub environment and you can be that guy. Again, you're the connector. You're the guy who leads them in. Then you end up with this life where everyone, 
it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. That's what Luke always says. You end up with this life where everybody kind of knows you, or at least one or two degrees of separation. I, I, I don't live in Miami. I've had no trouble getting into any club here because I'll call some, I'll call one person who will fix everything here for me. Uh, part of that obviously is because I live in Las Vegas, which is a huge advantage. But um, like, just it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. And, and then again, like if people even barely know who you are, mere exposure, they want to do things for you. They want to help you out. Got it, got it. No, that makes a lot of sense because every time you're doing something, you're providing value. Mm -hmm. It could be for a job or it could be for fucking someone. It's all value. Now, one thing you, one interesting thing you said is right before you go out, a lot of the time you go to the gym. Yes. And, and you know, the viewers know that when you know, I've worked out with you and we've done a lot of compound movements, a lot of uh, dumbbell, barbell exercises. And one thing that we know is that there's an increase in testosterone. Yes. Right after doing yes. heavy lifting, yes. they're doing compound movements and functional movements. Now, what's interesting is that we've talked about this before where a lot of guys that are in pickup have a problem with testosterone. They have a problem with uh, getting boners at clubs when they see hot girls, when they're grinding girls, they don't get boners. Or even when they, the girl is naked in front of them, they don't get boners. And I had this massive problem, okay. which got me into figuring out, pumped and getting my life back together uh, by working out and fixing my health and so on. But tell, tell us what is your experience, because you were the first one, you and Luke, to start the mansion in Vegas. Right. And you had a bunch of guys that you were taking care of, you were mentoring and pickup, and you were telling me stories about what they experienced. Yeah, I, I was, so I, I had no idea. When I watched the erectile dysfunction commercials on TV, I was like, well, maybe when I'm 60 or 70, that'll happen to me, I don't know. But when I started, uh, when we had 16 guys living in that house, and then I see over half of them have an erectile dysfunction, I just started to realize like, okay, well, maybe there's an issue here. Hmm. I'd always been in the gym. I played football in high school. You know, I play basketball once a week. Um, and so I guess from that standpoint, and you know what, I guess genetics, I'm Colombian. And I, hmm. I know a lot of Colombian guys were like fucking like hellcats. Like the guys always want to fucking fight and have sex with girls, right? So I don't, I don't know, maybe that has something to do with it. But I never had that problem. And then I would see these guys and then I would just, I, my, first thing, my first inclination is, okay, what am I doing different than what they're doing? And I, the diet and exercise was like the, the quickest thing to see. Also hydration and sleep. Those were the other two things uh, that I noticed. Uh, the, other thing, uh, the other thing that I noticed was um, that these guys, uh, I mean, hold on, I'm, I'm messing up here. I'm losing my train of thought. But um, the testosterone or the lack of testosterone was something that I knew came from exercise. I couldn't quantify it until I read this book called Spark. Have you read Spark? I have not. All right, so Spark is really good uh, because it sort of scientifically quantifies how not exercise has a more positive effect than beta blockers, than Prozac. Yes, yes. Exercise, they, they show, they will, they will take these, the results of prescribing these certain drugs and then they'll take another group of people and just make them run every day. Right. And time and time again the people who run every day like the the treatment that god gave you just go out and run every day works better than the drugs right. the drug but the the treatment god gave you doesn't make anyone any money and the drugs do right. so the pro and the funny thing is the guy who wrote this book i believe was the same guy who wrote uh the book on uh, one of the books on add uh, which is another thing that's been horribly over prescribed uh adderall, adderall yeah. uh and the I know a lot of people don't like this because it's the simple answer. You talk about Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie is the simple answer. A lot of people don't like the simple answer. The simple answer is, can you get out and run? I never met a guy who was consistent with his weight training and his cardio and his diet and then told me about the erectile dysfunction. I'm sure they're out there. I have no doubt that they are. None of our guys had that problem. Gotcha. Um, that would be the main issue for me. The other thing is, one of the things, the other things I noticed is how important testosterone is. I guess I, ne I, when I see the guys who didn't have it and I see the guys who do, the difference is night and day. I read a story about a, a woman who had a sex change and then she started getting hormone replacement so she got uh, testosterone. And then she's like, oh, I understand now. So like yeah. every second I think about sex now. Yeah. I want to fight for irrational reasons. Uh, I'm hungry. I'm like, like my, I had all this muscle mass and increased bone density. And 
she, when that, when that dis description had to her, and there was another gentleman who, he was like, he all of a sudden had super low testosterone for a while for treatment for some, some form of cancer or mm. something like that he had. And he was like, when I wasn't on testosterone, that it's like nothing tasted well, good. Like nothing, it's almost like testosterone is like, you know, like, people think that Adderall is that drug in Limitless. It's almost like testosterone mm. is that drug from Limitless, you know? And the way, the, the black and white description that he had when I didn't have testosterone, like, the, my life was bland and boring and I just didn't want anything and it was like I was just observing my life and then when I did want testosterone every woman who walked by I thought about the positions I could have intercourse with them and you, you have to ask yourself if that's the case then then somewhere in the and I know a lot of feminists won't like this but if if that's the case where you give testosterone to someone who's female and she starts thinking about sex all the time then that means somewhere in the species uh, evolution made it so that we have to think about sex all the time. Do you understand what yes. I'm saying? So maybe it's not wrong. Maybe maybe that's the way things are supposed to be. Just putting that out there. If we think about sex all the time and testosterone is causing us to do that, but it also causes us to live longer lives and be yes. healthier, yes. then maybe there's a reason that the species has that attribute. Yes. Maybe natural selection shows men specifically who have that attribute. Maybe there's something important there, yeah. this necessity. because. I've seen some of, uh, Luke has introduced me a lot of his new students and you can tell the difference immediately right. between the guys who you know, um, if you just let them alone with a girl who likes them, that maybe not that night, but eventually if they keep hanging out together, sex is inevitable. Yes. Whereas with other guys, you like, if they hang out with a girl that they like, sex is a question because you're not, you're not sure if there, there is, it doesn't matter how much a girl likes you, there is a moment of awkwardness that a guy has to get over to like where you start kissing and making out and then going to having sex. That if you, if you have this rush of testosterone, a lot of times you don't notice it. It doesn't feel awkward to you. Because right. you understand you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, we just went through a lot of like hormone and biology stuff right there. But yeah. <laughs> I, I can't speak from personal experience about low testosterone, but I can say like from having clients that I've seen on both, I've seen too much testosterone. Like hmm. I am from Texas, that the state with the biggest steroid problem. Yes. I used to think it was New Jersey, it's Texas. The, the biggest steroid problem in, in the country and to see just the rage and the fights and just the it like and then there's certain women that are completely into that they like guys who have like tiny balls and like they have acne on their back like that's actually sexy to them to right. see the acne on the guy's back because wow. they're so used to dating guys on roids mm. um, and it's kind of that's the that's the other side of it and it's crazy when you see stuff like that, and then like every spring at every gym across America, you see um, there's one there's one guy he's got a, a, a channel on YouTube, and all he does is film fights inside of gyms. Wow. And every spring there's these fights, and it's the same dudes just like sitting here. They're like this because they don't work out back at all; they just do chest, mm -hmm. and their arms are like this, and they just want to fucking fight and, pit, and they pick up weights and about. You know that's the other side of testosterone. Too much right. testosterone. Right. There's no right. balance. Right. Um, and right. and. Uh, in that case, you'll find these guys that like literally can't read the room. They have no ability. They have no emotional uh, intelligence anymore. Right. They lose any ability to like communicate uh, right. feelings at all. Everything is just rage, hunger, and revenge. You know. So totally. Yeah. You know. There's a balance. Got it. Yeah. And one one thing guys know that it's not just having high testosterone, but also low cortisol. Yeah. So when you're fight, when you're when you get when you encounter a confrontation with someone. You could have high testosterone, you can kick their ass, but you also don't want to react and go to jail for right. life, right? So there's this, uh, you know, masculinity, a, a big part of it has to do with having high testosterone, but it also has to do with having a decently low amount of cortisol. So you're not, you're not stressed all the time, right. you're not so, reactive all the yeah. time. Yeah, so, so cortisol, uh, your, your uh, renal glands will produce um, adrenaline. Right. And the cortisol is a is a side effect of that. So on the one hand, you would think, well, I have a lot of adrenaline, so I should be able to burn fat more. But what it does is like, if you're on a, an adrenaline rush, like I've talked to guys who've been to Iraq, I, I've flown over Iraq, but I haven't served down in the, in the dirt. The guys who've been to Iraq and you're under stress for 24 hours, your hands are shaking, you aren't, you aren't hungry. Right. That's like extreme levels of cortisol. I've, I've gone to SEER school, survival uh, innovation school, where they, they beat you and you don't eat for several days or whatever, mm -hmm. and you're under a great amount of stress for a long time, or going through a really bad breakup where there's like the 24 hours a day, there's no, 
right? That, that feeling that you're getting is your body continually trying to produce that adrenaline, mm -hmm. but like you can't keep up, like you can't operate at that level. And then you're not producing testosterone while you're doing the whole adrenaline. Now you're losing muscle mass, you're losing bone density. Right. Um, and, and, and then there's the depression that sort of feeds on itself because you don't have that testosterone coming in there. I remember Owen saying this, and I know this is an oversimplification if there's any cognitive psychologist out there, but he was like, isn't it funny how many disorders could be cured if guys were just like cool and had sex all the time? It's an interesting theory, just a theory, don't yell at me, but it's just a theory that if guys were having like exercise, diet, and sex on a regular basis, I will bet you that a lot of problems with ADD, depression, low testosterone, things like that would just magically cure themselves yeah. and you would never see this in any sort of medical paper because you can't make money off of it. So I just just a theory, I just can tell you anecdotally from my standpoint, everyone that I've seen, every single person that I've seen that has taken diet and exercise seriously uh, and then, you know, I. I I think having meaningful sex on a regular basis is something that is a is a is a laudable goal. Um, meaningful sex. I don't mean like just oh I want to bang 200 girls this year and like just so that I can prove that I can do it. That's not meaningful sex. Um, but doing that, I think you'd be surprised because the, again it has to do with this. Like you remember I said how the running yeah. will cure a lot of the disorders. That's the natural thing that humans can do. That's why we can walk upright. That's why we have knees that are that are built the way that we do so that we can run. If running can cure a lot of these disorders, depression right. and even reduce cortisol and all that kind of stuff, and lifting weights can do those things, then that would probably also mean that like eating paleo, stuff that we ate when we were cavemen, running, stuff that we could do when we were cavemen, having sex on a regular basis, something that the caveman did. Read Sex at Dawn mm -hmm. if you ever if you ever want to learn any more about that. Doing those things is probably more likely to fix those problems and you have the solutions to a lot of those problems built in already. Right. Because you've got, you have to understand like this pharmaceutical industry is a couple hundred years old, but like legitimately maybe 40 or 50 years old where they had any clue what they were doing. Whereas uh, humans, like upright, upstanding humans are about 1.9 million years old and Homo sapiens sapiens is about, um, about 400,000 years old to 200,000 years old. That's there, there had to have been, that's, all, that's why I always have a problem when people are like, you need to go to this meditation class and you need to go to this show. Like, well, like I, I'm not saying that that stuff's harmful, but my, my question is what happened to the guy in the 15th century? Like, so none of them were happy ever? No human was happy before you found Bikram yoga? Like that was the only, you understand what I'm saying? Like, no, eat this, you have to go have this smoothie and eat this green tea and I'm like, so you're telling me before that green tea or whatever was invented, no one was happy before that? No one. Like no one had, we were just all fucked before that happened. Like people don't understand that the, the, a lot of times the answer is in you. The answer is a job. The answer is a meaningful relationship. The, man, the answer is to be around friends and family. The answer is to laugh. The answer is to eat normal, non-processed food. The yes. answer is to hydrate. The answer is to get a, a normal amount of sleep. But again, those are the simple answers. A lot of people don't want to hear those things. But for me, I always think like, if this body was designed to live in an era that is not the current era that I'm living in now, then perhaps the solutions to my problems exist back there in the Paleolithic era and not today and during the, you know, the technological revolution, so. Right, that's yeah. interesting because one of the main points of the program you know, pumped is going all natural because mm -hmm. I tried a lot of things. You know, I was injecting myself with stuff. I took a lot of supplements. I tried every diet out there, every yeah. type of exercise, and I realized that the pharmaceutical prescription drugs don't help. Yeah, they actually hurt. Right. So that that's a really interesting point. The other thing is when you talk about evolutionary psychology. You know, Michael's the guy who actually got me to read all the evolutionary psychology books that I've read. So I really appreciate that. Now, if that going all natural, lifting and eating healthy, if that's the solution from the Paleolithic era, then why is it that specifically our pickup community is so much not doing those? Right, so, so the thing is, um, there are guys who are born like with really dominant right brains who are able to read the room. Maybe some of them are good looking, some of them are tall, uh, some of them are athletic, and they get automatically put into these situations where they they just do well with women okay 
So a lot of those guys will never find the pickup community. Right. So let's ask who will find the pickup community. Mm. The guys that for whatever reason, maybe it had something to, environmental, maybe it was something biological, genetic, you know, you, you were just put in a situation where you have this tall, good looking brother and you're like the little brother, like Danny DeVito and twins, right? You're in a situation like that or you are put in a situation where you're, you're behind the eight ball financially all the time. Uh, you have genetics to where you just put on weight without even really trying. Like, listen, you can, you can lift weights and live healthy and you'll probably never look like Brandon Carter. Right. You understand? Because a lot of that is genetics. Even though Brandon Carter works really, really hard, yeah. a lot of that, like I'll probably never work at, like look like Brandon Carter no matter how much I lift, right? Um, the, a lot of those things, you know, you just kind of have to, you have to do on your own. The thing is, what I found is, especially with the pickup community, because I have hmm. very, very deep opinions about the pickup community, yeah. is that the pickup community is not a normal subset of, of young, healthy, neurologically normal males. The pickup community, something went wrong for you to come here, and including me, right? Because I, I got in the pickup community in 05, right? I, I found it, um, that something went wrong. And in, in my situation, my dad did everything magnificently for me growing up, but he never talked to me about women, okay? And I never had a role model in my life uh, to understand how specifically to talk to women. So I found other guys who pointed me in a different direction. Now, to be honest with you, I listened to them for about a year and then I stopped listening to them and I just found guys who were good with women and listened to them instead. Um, but the problem is the type of guys who come into the community, there is the guy who really needs our, our help and then there is the guy who really just wants to manipulate uh, females and other males to get as far as he can uh, giving as little as he can. Right. And so what happens is... Like a win-lose. Right, right. Okay. So what happens is, like, if I take a person who's decrepit and I give them a lot of money, now you're just a decrepit person with a lot of money. I didn't fix your problems, right? Right. And if, I, if you're a, a shitty person and then all of a sudden you learn pickup techniques, now you're just a shitty person with pickup techniques. You haven't improved your life at all. You haven't developed no level of empathy. The way I... The way I separate people in my mind, I don't care about what color you are, how much money you make, or anything like that. There are two types of people that I identify. There are low empathy people and high empathy people that I deal with. And by the way, all the low empathy people, that doesn't mean they're all bad. I know some low empathy people who are some of the most effective operators I've ever met, especially when I was in the military. I met a lot of very low empathy people who were extremely good operators, okay? Um, extremely good salesmen, extremely technical people. They have just have no empathy for other human beings. Little empathy, little hmm. empathy. If you have no empathy, if you're a zero on the one to ten empathy scale, that makes you a sociopath. Right. But a lot of there are a lot of functioning sociopaths. I know for a fact I used to date one. She and I didn't realize she was a sociopath until I realized she's incapable of crying. Uh, she absolutely doesn't care about anyone. She right. she completely destroys and hurts everyone that she's ever dated, and she enjoys watching them in pain. I didn't realize that at the time, but like that's zero empathy. Right? Or a guy who like is always trying to fuck his friend's girlfriends. Like he can't help it, he's always doing it and then asking for forgiveness later. That's zero empathy. I'm talking about you'll meet guys that have like level one, two, and three like, empathy. Just a little bit of empathy. Like they kind of care, like they're like, oh Merry Christmas, mom. You know, they call mom a couple times a year. Like if their brother if their brother died, they would like fly home, but they're not super mushy mushy. Whereas a point, like if you're a 10 on the empathy scale, like you literally can't function. Every homeless person you see like brings you into tears. You you think about all, all like Luke. Luke is always kind of making fun of me because I'm a little too empathetic mm -hmm. a lot of times. Where it's like I'll meet a girl who's clearly hitting on me, and I'm like, bro, I don't want to I don't want to hit on her back because she has a boyfriend, and I want to respect the sanctity of a relationship. And then everyone in the room just laughs their ass off at me. They think I'm they think that's hilarious that I respect the sanctity of the relationship. They're like, clearly she's gonna cheat on him with somebody. Right. Might as well be you, right? So there's there's just different ways to look at it. But like, um, when the pickup in the pickup community specifically, unfortunately, a disproportionate, a disproportionately high number of extremely low empathy people have come to the pickup community. And because of that, they wanna learn from you to win. They don't wanna learn from you to make the world a better place or even to be happy mm. because because really, there's like, there, if you are if you have no empathy, there are moments of pleasure, but there's no happiness for you. So they just want that next girl to have sex with, right? I have a friend of mine, he like, he, he specifically gets, and again, this is a low empathy human being. I like the guy, I do, but this is gonna sound horrible. 
he likes to meet girls who specifically want to get money out of him and then have sex with them and give them no money and then just like be, ex and then brag to all his friends about how he had sex with them with no money. For a lot of guys, they're like, that's good game. What are you talking about? That's awesome. For me, it's like, like again, uh, are the girls without blame? Of course not. But like being that is your only uh, method, you're like, I, I want to find a relationship. I want to, I, like I said before, meaningful sex. You're not going to find meaningful sex or a meaningful relationship with that's your only goal. I'm not trying to judge that person. Again, I didn't say low empathy was sure. bad, sure. but I said, but low empathy is, will cause problems. When you get in a room full of low empathy people, no one's going to work together for their own benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? Like I'm here this week in Miami. I want to do, you know, stuff with you, Luke. If Owen needs me to do anything, I'm going to work for another company. And like, again, anything they ask me to do, I'm going to do it and think about everything, the cost benefit analysis, none of that even, the ROI, none of that comes into play. I'm just going to continue to offer value because I know in the end that it's helpful to other people. And I'm trying to see myself through other people, like how, how they would see in other people, whether or not they would appreciate it, or even if they wouldn't appreciate it. I just want to offer value. I just know I have enough experience in life to know that if I am continually uh, offering value to people, mm -hmm. that in the end, everything just seems to work out. You know, so Got so it. that's that's sort of the delineation. You will meet the low empathy people who don't look for win-win situations, right. and then you will see the high empathy people who who are constantly looking for win-win situations. And I believe long term, you end up with a guy like Warren Buffett who is always looking for win-win situations, right. and then then that ends up being better. Um, you know, I was going to say a guy like George Soros, but I don't know George Soros mm -hmm. personally. Um, you know, that, that that's just the Bernie Madoff would be a, an example of someone with no empathy. Uh, you know that that's those are two different ways to be. If if you have no empathy, if you are like a real legit sociopath, which by the way I'm going to tell you, you and I we, we meet lots of them. We may not recognize that they're sociopaths because they're some of the funniest, most fun people you've ever met in your life. Right. But when you meet those people that are sociopaths, they're so fun and they're so funny, and you think like, man, I wish I could be like. They're almost you almost envy them at, part, at first because they have no approach anxiety ever, mm -hmm. right? Because they have no shame. They have no like. You would need shame to have approach anxiety, and they have none. Right. Um, when you meet those people, it's kind of scary, and they'll do so well with women and, and initially, and you're like, wow, maybe I should just lie to every girl I meet and tell her that I just want kids and I want to get married today, yeah. and I just can't find a good woman. Or like, I, I, I'm, I'm just one guy who's a sociopath, and he's like. The guy tells every girl that like his wife just died. Like he just goes low, like super low below yeah. the belt. You have to watch out for people like that. So your question before is why are these guys not working out? Why are these guys not doing that? Well, yeah. It's because in your mind, you want this overall package that leads to the, the pinnacle, right? Maslow's higher needs. Now I'm out here at the top, self-actualization and happiness. Yeah. Those guys with the low empathy aren't. Okay. They're just here to find a temporary solution to the problem. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. A temporary solution to problem A and they keep doing it over and over again. It's another, it's also a reason why cold approach is so prevalent in the pickup community and social circle isn't. Right. Social circle naturally, if you were to ask any woman or guy who's really good with women, social circle, and they were, they were going to like sort of devise a pickup community, they would say, well, it should be built around social circle. But it co of course, our pickup community mm. in its current configuration is not. Right. Our current configuration of, of, of this pickup community is 85% cold approach yes. and like 2% yeah. social circle. Right. And when it, it's always social circle, like they just mention these, they use these buzzwords and phrases, but they never do any of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like they don't understand. Like when I... When I go and talk to, uh, my, I see a guy talking to a girl, the first thing you need to do is understand, are her friends comfortable, right? But if you do cold approach all the time, are her friends comfortable is a question that you come upon, you're like, well, what, let me wait till I'm hooked, and then I'll t I'm hooked in the set, and then I'll talk to these other girls. No, the first wow. thing you yeah. need to do yeah. is worry about whether or not her friends are comfortable. Yeah. When uh, the set is, like I'll tell you, you know what a perfect set looks like? A perfect set looks like me leaning up against the bar, the girl I'm talking to with both arms around me, me facing her friend, and her, me and her friend doing 80% of the conversation while the girl is just sitting here listening to the whole thing. That's what a perfect set looks like. Do you understand? That's what a perfect set, but guys don't understand that at all. They think I need to like, like I need to do some sort of hypnotic, there's some sort of trick. I'm just gonna talk to the girl like, no, making her friend feel, com feel comfortable makes her feel comfortable. And they don't get that part of it. Um, 
And again, why? It's because low empathy people just want cold approach, cold approach, cold approach, cold approach, cold. Because every time I, if I do the cold mm -hmm. approach and I say the magic words to get the girl into bed, and I just do that enough times, then I'll die happy, I guess. I don't know what they, they think is gonna happen. But like, for the yeah. social circle thing, it requires the ability to read the room and a high level of empathy. Comes back to that word empathy. And yeah. if you don't have that, if you don't have any empathy, then it becomes very difficult to, to be able to do a lot of those things. Even, like Luke says some of the bluest jokes I've ever heard in my life in set. Like some of the most horrible thing, the ho most horrible jokes I've ever heard. Like, like they're funny, but they're just like, you'd never say them in public. Right. But he still can read the room. He knows where the line is. He just gets a lot closer to crossing the line than most people does. But he definitely does care about people uh, that are in his circle. Do you understand? So. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the delineation for me. There's a lot of low empathy people that come into the pickup community and they don't, they don't want that, that big picture, long-term solution. They just want the mm -hmm. short-term solution. So the short-term solution is learn cold approach, not learn cold approach and get in shape so that the getting in shape gives you more energy to go out and do. That, that, that whole cyclical one part of your life feeding into another, that doesn't mean anything to them because that's about life improvement. They just want to have more sex with women. And if it, if it involves lying or being deceitful, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Just that whatever is gonna solve that short-term problem, that's the answer that they want. So they only stay for the cold approach pickup part and they don't care about the eating better, getting more sleep, living a fulfilled life with lots of cool friends part. That part is boring to them and it doesn't mean anything to them. Got it, okay. The um one problem that I've seen is year after year after year, people, a lot of the guys that we know, they're doing the same thing. And as they're doing the same thing, they're failing, they're succeeding. Uh -huh. Their brain is kind of getting trained in a certain way. Yes. Right? Those synapses are becoming stronger and stronger. So the question is, what can someone who's listening, who wants to become advanced, or wants to have a fulfilling life, wants to have a high quality of life, an overarching, uh, wonderful energy and, and feel when he's at the club or even uh, in a relationship, what can he do every day? How can he climb that ladder to becoming successful in a holistic way? What, what, what can, you know, someone's confused, like, should I eat better? Should I exercise? Like, I'm confused. I've never done this before. I've been doing stupid shit for 10 years. What would they do? So you, have, I'm sure you've seen this as well as I have. The guys that are in the community for a long time Right? And like you said, they're, they're doing the same thing over and over again, and they're not taking inventory on whether or not it actually worked. Okay. Right? And so they keep doing the same thing over and over again. I had this saying, if you ever read The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, he doesn't say it this way, but this is the way I would describe it. Your ego is not there to make you happy. Your ego is just there to create an identity for you. Okay. If I do something over and over again, even if it fails, it's still, it's still valuable in creating an identity for me. Right, so if I'm the guy who goes and I'm super aggressive when I go and talk to girls and like grab them and try to pick them up and spin them around every time, even though it doesn't work most of the time, it doesn't matter because I've created an identity for myself of being that guy, hmm. right? Um, and by the way, if I'm the guy who's like super passive and expects girls to pick me, which I know a lot of super good looking guys or rich guys that are like this, they like just expect the girls to come to them and then they don't ever, they leave alone. Uh, that's also an identity. Oh, I'm too good. I don't want to like. I don't want to go and approach this girl. I'm afraid. Like I'm gonna because their identity is they're this cool guy who, mm. who's like too good to go approach. Mm. And so if they go approach and they get rejected, then their identity is destroyed. And people will do anything to not have their identity be destroyed. The first thing I can tell you is the you know the power of now by Eckhart Tolle, and then the one thing another book by yeah. Gary Keller. Um, you need to again it goes back to habitual things. If you start habitually doing things the right way then you're going to get into a better habit pattern at, when it comes to working out. But more importantly than that, step number one is mentors. But like, okay. like here's the thing, like, not mentors because they did really good SEO on a YouTube channel. Mentors that you actually physically can see irrefutable visual evidence that they are successful at whatever they do. Like, so I trade stock options with guys who are multi, multi-millionaires at trading stock options. I have seen their TD Ameritrade accounts with my own eyes and see the millions and millions of dollars in those accounts with my own eyes right. and follow them trade for trade. Like that's the level of irrefutable visual evidence that I need 
in order to follow them as opposed to like Investors Business Daily or some other nonsense that is never gonna help you make money, right? right? Like any, any financial news network on TV, none of that shit is actionable, none of it, right? Most of those guys don't even trade, but the guys who actually do trade, those are the ones that I sought out. For the working out, I look for guys that are around my age, around my physique, and I see that I see the irrefutable visual evidence that you went from this and then you got to this, right? I want to see that specifically with my own eyes and then work from there, work from a positive place. Like when I see the girl I want, what is the first thing I look for? Do you remember I told you this? When I see, when I see the girl I want walking in the club, the first thing I look for is what's the guy she's with? Mm -hmm. I want to see the yeah, guys, yeah. I want to see the, the shoes, the pants, mm -hmm. the belt, the yeah. shirt, right? A lot of guys are like, I'm alpha, I don't need that, blah, blah, blah. I'm just, I'm just cool, I deserve it. I deserve it because I'm such, no. I want to see the guy that she is in alignment with and then see, can I do something approaching that? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes the guy's covered in tattoos and he sells cocaine. That's not the guy I can align with. But sometimes I can't. Mm -hmm. And then, then maybe, maybe you know, I'll, I'll, what I'll start to see is that these attractive guys tend to all do the X instead of Y. They tend to go to the gym as far as not to go to the gym. They tend to be funny as opposed to not be funny. Mm -hmm. They tend to do so. Like a lot of guys that I know that are really good with women, a lot of them don't go to bed at 7 a.m. Uh, at, at 7. A lot of them don't go to bed at 10 p.m. A lot of them go to bed at 5 a.m. Okay, so then I maybe need to switch my clock around a little bit, you know? Um, so there's just things like that. Like, by the way, I've, I've said this before, and this is going to stir up, a, ruffle up a lot of feathers. You want to know a really good way to never get laid is start going to bed at 10, 10 p.m. That's a really great way. Go, i got to get up at 7 a.m. so I can do my little Snapchat workout and show that the sun is coming up because I'm going to suffer. Like, That's a really great way to never, ever get laid is to do that. I know so many girls who are in that situation where they're like working out every day. And then they're like, oh, it's time to go to the club. No, but I have a I have a 6.30 a.m. yoga class that I have to go to. And then they're like, well, you have this incredible body and no one to ever see it. So congratulations, right? Like the social events happen when people let loose and that tends to happen at night. So if that's what you're interested in, then you need to push your schedule to the right. I know this is very counter to what a lot of people will tell you. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, like, you can, this whole idea, well, like, I can't eat after dark. I've actually met women that are this ignorant. They're like, Oh, I work at a nightclub and I get off at 3.30 in the morning, but I saw some diet that said I can't eat after dark, so I don't eat at all. I go to work and don't eat, and then I stay out of work all night and I don't eat at all because I'm not supposed to eat after dark. Like, no, you're not supposed to eat a couple hours before bed, not after dark. It has nothing to do with shit. Like, they're just so confused. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you know, just back to what, what the original question, which was, um, what was it you were saying? The one thing that they could do routinely. Yeah, the, the, the one thing that, that they can do routinely is to find mentors that are, that are doing exactly what it is that they want. Like Ty Lopez, for instance, mm -hmm. he's kind of a, like, he's a friend of mine. Sure. Um, his book club has been really effective in f helping me find mentors. Like Ty has been, Ty is one of the most amazing signposts I've ever seen where he can put me into a direction because Omnivore's Dilemma, History of the Human Body, Sugar, Salt, Fat, those books really opened my mind up to things that I kind of knew what was true because I, I, I was eating better and getting in shape, but it sort of like codified why these mm -hmm. things were, that I was doing were working. Uh, and then the evolutionary psychology books, things that as a man you kind of know are true, but like now here's science to show you why they're true. And not only that, the things that are true in evolutionary psychology are so against cultural norms and they're so against political correctness that you're like, well, how come no one ever taught me this stuff? Right. And you know, and you realize, well, because behaviorist, behavioral psychology doesn't want you to know about evolutionary psychology. So, um, yeah, I mean, just a lot of that. I would find mentors that are good at, uh, like, the thing is, the problem is we, the, the guys who know they need to find mentors, there's a whole market out there of people trying to be pseudo mentors. Like, I think Anthony Robbins has some fantastical, fantastic motivational stuff. Anthony Robbins does not know a fucking thing about how to manage money. I'm sorry, I, I, like, get, send your hate mail to me, I don't care. He knows absolutely nothing. I've read some of his strategies, he does, he has no idea what he's talking about. Um, a lot of, but, but uh, by that by that rationale, also there's a lot of hedge fund managers. If you go, I've seen several experiments, they take the top five hedge fund managers in 2013, mm -hmm. they're the bottom five in 2014. 
the top five in 2015, they're the bottom five in 2016. Mm. Because those, everyone makes money in a bull market, but like, again, no one's looking at these things. They just see really good marketing, a really cool book that says how to make money in stocks. Like I read that book by Bill O'Neill, and like the things he says in that book are not, like, bu like buy high and sell higher. What the fuck are you talking about? Like that doesn't work. Right. Like there's no way that works. It doesn't, I know, because I, I do maybe 2,000 trades a year. That's not realistic. But it's really good selling point, and it's a really good way for Bill O'Neill to make money. Right. And I hate to I hate to bash on Bill O'Neill because Bill O'Neill is he's a he's a SMU Mustang and a former Air Force officer like me. But Bill is just like like the this stuff doesn't work. And we look at those things and we try to use them for as our mentors, right? Some guys like Robert Kiyosaki, he has a lot of good things that he has to say. But I, you don't have access to Robert Kiyosaki every day. Unless you're like super rich and you go to the, some of those mastermind groups right. where you pay $25,000 to hang out with Richard Branson, then, then maybe you can hang out with Robert Kiyosaki. But for the most part, like there's some good advice in there, but I think it would be more beneficial if you found a guy who is actually making money in real estate that you can get access to every day. I think those in touch, like those touchable, tangible right. guys, right. And one of the things like you're so easy to get a hold of, one of those, tu those touchable, tangible things, like, I was listening to this one reporter who said he called Warren Buffett's office and Warren Buffett picks up the phone. Like a lot of people are still shocked by that. Like, like there are people out there that are, that are touch, that are, that are tangible that you can get a hold of and that you can talk to that those people are more likely better mentors for you than like, for instance, the funny thing is with my relationship with Owen Cook, I talk to Owen more about business and videography than I talk to him about pickup, right? Because Owen is a fantastic businessman. People don't realize this. He's also very generous. Like there's a lot of things about Owen that people don't realize. I talk to him about that stuff more than I talk to him about pickup. Do you understand? But then, then again, I happen to have access to him because he's one of my good friends. Like a lot of people, you need to find that that mentor in your life. But he need you need to see irrefutable visual evidence that this guy is what he says he is. Because man, there are so many frauds out there. There's so like one of the things Luke and I both have a right my best friend Luke Crow and I we both have uh, IT background so whenever we hear a guy speak he and I will go do we will go do a ton of background checking on this guy uh, on whoever we see speak and most of the time they are full of shit and that's that's a huge issue that a lot and then but the problem is what did I just say look for mentors what does Ty say look for mentors but the problem is those guys are full of shit and they're offering you I will be your mentor right and then so we get a bunch of people going in the wrong direction but because you paid fifty nine ninety five for this bad information, then that now becomes who you are. Yeah. You want to make that fifty nine ninety five worth something, so you follow this bullshit uh, strategy, and then you do that over and over again, and you think that you think that well, this is this is the way to go, and you you end up creating an identity or uh, uh, about uh, around that bad strategy, or you end up like a lot of guys do, which is even worse. You think I'm going to do this all by myself. I know there's one guy who trades stock options and the guy thinks he can make it up all on his own and he just keeps losing money and making excuses why it doesn't work. I know guys who get into the pickup community and they think they can do it all on their own and they keep screwing up and they're like, like someone already invented the wheel. You don't have to reinvent the whole thing. Like scan, like Isaac Newton used, you know, uh, Copernicus and, and Kepler's, you know, equations in order to come up with his idea about gravity, right? Like Einstein looked at what Michael Faraday and, and uh, Maxwell did before him to come up with the ideas of re relativity. So like you stand on the shoulders of giants. There are people out there that have done the research and can help you, but you have to do the research and you need to not fall for the marketing. That's the problem when finding mentors. That's why I say you need to find the one that lives down the street because he might be more valuable for you because that guy who lives up the street uh, and, and this is Ty and I kind of differ on this. Ty thinks the best guys to listen to are billionaires and the worst guys to listen to are the guys who make a million dollars a year, right? Ty thinks the guys who make a million dollars a year, well, they're kind of making some money so they think they know what they're doing but they might be lucky. But the guys who made a billion dollars, mm. you really need, right? So it's, it's kind of, I, I kind of disagree with that. I think like you need to, because the, your mentor is a signpost. Your mentor is not doing all the work for you. He needs to kind of tell you, try this and not do this. And by the way, I don't do everything my mentors say, but I do want the information and I want to glean the experience that they have. So finding mentors in finance, finding mentors in health, finding mentors with your diet, finding mentors with 
uh, your social circle and finding mentors with relationships and women, you should find mentors in all those situations. I also find mentors when I want to buy a house, when I want to buy a car, like all those things. I, I have a mentor when it comes to shooting camera, like w when I buy camera equipment. I find mentors for all those different things, right? Okay. So that, that would be the number one piece of advice. And then after that, I would read The One Thing, The Power of Now. Those books are amazing. I would read Flow by Mihai, it just says Mihai. And I would read, um, what's the other one? That I just love. Oh, I can't remember right now. I definitely I read Spark. Like if, if you're not working out, like Spark uh, would, would help you get to that place. But the other, like super, oh, Dale Carnegie, How to Make Friends and Influence People. That book is so, it is one of the most famous books ever written and still incredibly underrated. It's just like when I'm listening to that book, I'm like starting to realize that like all these guys doing these self-help speeches and like they're just reading Dale Carnegie because mm -hmm. you won't. They're reading Dale Carnegie because you won't read Dale Carnegie. They're saying the shit he's saying, right? Uh, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. They're reading Stephen Covey because you won't, because you're too fucking lazy. And then they're going to sit there and, and, and re-say that shit and then sell it to you when you could just read it on your own. Like there's everything in the self-help community can be summarized in How to Make Friends and Influence People and The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'm telling you, those two books are so like beneficial for that, right? Uh, like books like Flow, those books tell you why they work, but, right. but those two books specifically give you the game plan because human psychology hasn't changed since Dale Carnegie was alive, right? Uh -huh. No, it, it hasn't, right? So those, like people don't like the simple answer. They don't like the easy solution. They hate that shit. They want you to give me the seven words to help me bang the six strippers tonight. How do I fuck the six strippers tonight? Yo, you're gonna for for $29.95, I'll give you my ebook and it will tell you the one sentence that you didn't know. Like, pickup companies hate me because I've given you the one hypnotic set like lies. Bullshit. All of it is bullshit. And that's that's the thing. Facebook has allowed us to get marketed to by the wrong people, and that's that's part of the problem, you know? That's a very long answer to your question, so. Thank but, you, uh, thank you. Do we have any more water, by the way? Right here. Uh, yeah, uh, final question. And then we're gonna get into this thing. I'll explain it later, but yeah, yeah. final question is this concept of looks don't matter, right? So when I first got into pickup, I had a thought about what that meant. Looks don't matter, and what I used to think is, the way you look doesn't matter. Now, if it's true or false, now I've evolved in terms of my understanding. I want to know from your side because you know Michael used to be overweight. You know, I've seen your photos on Facebook, and you know your look was different back then, and now it's way more fit. And you're probably one of the most fit guys in our community. Uh, so, what is what is your take on looks don't matter? And how do you want to clarify this to people who have the wrong interpretation? All right, so the correct answer to looks don't matter is sort of, gotcha. or sometimes, or in some situations. All right. This is so simple and completely like, the, the, this answer is unavoidable, but so many people have a problem with this answer. A lot of the reasons why is because women, like there are some women out there, if you meet a woman who only cares about looks, which there are women who only care about looks, there are guys right now watching this right now who only like girls with big asses. If you saw a girl with a flat ass, I'm not interested in her. So can't you see that there might be some men out there that only care about, or some women out there that only care about looks? They're just like us. They're just the opposite side of the same coin, right? Same, same they have the same 23 chromosomes that you do, right? So the thing about it is, are there women out there that just care about looks? Absolutely. I know one a female friend of mine, she's 43. She keeps dating the same guy over and over again. He's got big arms. He's usually a steroid dealer. He's covered in tattoos. He's spiky hair and he has he's white. Always the same guy. She keeps making up these reasons why she's dating him. He's good with his kids and he's he likes dogs and all, but it's all bullshit. She just wants that look. How, now, what percentage of women are like that? If you look at the, the random distribution curve, right? You have uh, the standard deviation, which is in the middle, right? And that's the point where the curve goes from concave to convex. That middle part is 68%. Most people live in that 68%. And then there's the two tails. Those two tails are 16%. So 16, 16 is 32 plus 68 is 100. 16%, I believe, of women only care about looks. Ty Lopez actually talked about this. He said one in six. Well, one in six is about 17%, 17.5%. 17 
one in six. So about 16% of women only care about looks, about 16% of women only care about money, about 16% of women uh, only care about whether or not he'll buy you shit. 16% of women only care about status. Now what happens unfortunately is a lot of times they're overlapping 16%. Right. And you go to uh, you go to Story or Live on a Saturday night and those big titty blondes with the with the had the liposuction and the fucking uh, the the uh, the Botox. Those girls happen to be the ones who only care about looks, only care about money, only care about status. And so what happens is you as the guy who's in the pickup and you go out all the time, you see your brain misses the 25 girls who just walk by you and you just see the big titty blonde at the table and you're like, women are all whores because all they care about is money. Your reticular activation system only noticed the girl with the blondest hair and the biggest boobs. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> the girl with the most Instagram followers. Why? Because Instagram keeps promoting that girl to you, right? To Facebook keeps putting that girl on your feet and you start thinking all women are like that and they're not. <coughs> so the thing is, do, do looks matter? Looks matter completely to 16% of women. Unfortunately, those women manifest themselves more in social situations. Why? Because they're looking for good looking guys, aggressively, right? Like uh, Dan Bolzerian, I consider him a friend. Dan is in a situation where he's around so many women who are so aggressive and sexual that if he met a really nice girl who liked him just for him, she might have trouble getting around all the other women mm. who are like with the bigger boobs, and the blonder hair trying to aggressively get to Dan. Do you understand what I'm saying? He sort of painted himself in that corner. So in his mind, he probably thinks all women are like that. Who knows, who knows? I don't, I don't know, I can't speak for Dan. But like some women are, uh, some guys are like, well, do women only care about money? And the answer is the same thing I said about looks. About 16% of women, by the way, it's not exactly 16%, right? What I'm just saying is like, not all women only care about money. There's a 16% that only care about money. There's a 68% that care about it sometimes and don't care about other times. Then there's a 16% that like don't care at all, right? So the thing is, um, is it high probability to have money or to not have money? I know guys that don't have any money and have beautiful girlfriends. If they had money, does that mean that they wouldn't have beautiful girlfriends? I mean, don't get me wrong, you really can screw it up. Like you can have a bunch of money. Like I've seen guys get money and then they go into provider frame all the mm -hmm. time. I've seen guys get in shape and then they stopped approaching because they're so good looking that they expect like girls to come up and talk to them. That's just as bad. But you can get in shape, you can make more money, you can be higher status and still do well with women. So is the high probability move to do better or to not do better? The high probability, probability move is to do better. Right. So yeah, got it. Um, so for the final part of the mastermind with Michael Sartain, uh, I do this with all my guests. I give you a word mm -hmm. and just say a one sentence that comes to your mind associated with this word. That's like a rapid, rapid fire. One sentence. God, yeah, one sentence. I don't know if I've ever done one sentence. <laughs> one to do sentences for you. One to 19 sentences. All right, so healthy food. Uh, paleo, grain brain, uh, the, the omnivore's dilemma. Okay. Favorite exercise? Uh, yeah. Incline push-up. Uh, curls. Okay. Dine. Well, I think Emily Sears, I'm trying to think the prettiest girls I've ever seen in person and on uh, Instagram. Emily Sears would be one. There's a girl named Jean Watts who's like phenomenal in person. Uh, Jen Mateo. Um, God, Miss, oh, uh, Melanie Campoy. She works over at Omnia. That girl's really pretty in person. And who else? I'm trying to think. Well, you could look all, look them all up, but like right. some Instagram models don't look in person like like what they do, of you know, on Instagram. Source. Playboy. Oh wait, hold oh, on. Sorry. Okay. Amanda Lamaju and Danica Parker, my two closest friends. Yes. They are both beautiful in person, also. I agree. Yeah. Um, okay. Playboy. Um, a word and a company, a company that's kind of split. Uh, that I'm a little bit involved with. You have the Hugh Hefner, mm -hmm. the Crystal Hefner side of it, and then you have the Mind Geek Playboy Plus side of it with the Cyber Girls. Playboy is, it doesn't mean what it used to mean. I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where it will go, but this is gonna sound really counter to nor normal cultural stuff. I do think that being in shape, a lot of that, a lot of those girls wanna go be in Playboy. Like that's kind of still an honor for them, so I think if it helped girls get in shape, then I think it, you know, overall it's kind of a good thing. I like, I'm, I'm pro Playboy. All right, me too. P 
party. I think a party should be first and foremost a social event to share with people that either you can make their lives better or people that make your lives better, make your life better. Testosterone. Um, underrated is the first thing I think of. A key to so much of what, not only for men, but for women too. Women get that rage when they go to the gym sometimes too. Like a huge key for like this colorful, active, like vibrant, bold life, I think. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Brilliant mastermind. Really appreciate you for uh, providing so much value to our viewers. And uh, that's it. That's it for Michael. If you have any last words, give it to him and... Uh, you know, just follow this guy. These, these guns are getting bigger every week. He's got that testosterone. Crush your hand with their handshake and everything. It's weird. <laughs> Get that testosterone in your life. Listen to what this guy has to say. And go find some mentors. And uh, yeah. All right. This is Dr. Testosterone, and we'll see you in the next Mastermind.